Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is David Wood. I'm the Special Projects Manager for Early Music America. We'd like to thank you for joining us for uh, the next in our series of, uh, of interest sessions that we've been offering on Mondays for the past several weeks. We're very excited to have Rebecca Sipis here to uh, present. Um, on the Early Music America website, uh, we have a review of uh, a related uh, of the of a book uh, related and a recording, so you can find that um, by either searching for uh, Rebecca's name or searching for um, Sarah Levy, um, and you can find that information on our website. If you're curious about more and you want to listen, we actually have the Spotify playlist of the recordings, so you can listen um, there right from the CD review uh, of that recording as well. Um, just a few things uh, ahead of the presentation. So I mentioned to those who joined us uh, toward the beginning that uh, when we get to the end, we will use the Q&A function, uh, which if you're joining us with Zoom, you can see Q&A in your uh, little toolbar at the bottom, and you can type in uh, you can type in your questions there and we'll monitor those and toward the end we'll leave some time to, to answer those. Um, if you have questions through the event uh, in terms of technical events, you can feel free to send me a private message um, using the chat feature. Uh, and then toward the end, if there are, if there, depending on how much time and how many questions we have, we, uh, we have, we may actually have some of the questions, have you, some of you ask them uh, using your microphone and we can unmute you at that point uh, based on those uh, Q&A bits that come through there. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, Early Music America and our upcoming interest sessions, we invite you to go to our website, which is earlymusicamerica.org. From the website, uh, you can also find out about our relief fund, which is still open for donations at this point, although right now the application is closed uh, pending uh, further funding. Uh, we wanna give a quick uh, thank you to everyone who has donated. We're over $75,000 in the, in the relief fund right now, which is enough to uh, support 300 musicians, uh, early musicians in need. Uh, and so that's been a fantastic response in just over a month since the relief fund was launched. Uh, between Early Music America and Gotham Early Music Scene. And we want to thank um, GEMS for their support as well. You can find out about our activities and upcoming interest sessions, as well as some of the other webinars that we're having for EMA members um, the next two Wednesdays and a Collegium Directors meeting that's going to be coming up on Friday. And more by following us through our speaker here on the screen. Uh, also, this interest session and past will be archived on our YouTube channel and on our website as well. Uh, from the website, if you go to the online interest sessions page, which is under what EMA does, then you can find the videos from the past sessions. Uh, this one will be archived there by tomorrow as well. And if you'd like to know about our uh, other resources, news from around the early music field and more, you can sign up for our email list. Uh, either at the bottom of earlymusicamerica.org or by using SMS. You can just text early music to <laughs> 2828 and that will start you on the process. Um, we send out a Tuesday email and right now because of the rapidly changing nature um, of the uh, global health crisis, we've also been issuing a Friday update just to uh, allow as many resources to be shared during this time as possible. But in general, those are uh, those are Tuesday emails, uh, so we try not to send out any more uh, than necessary. So once again, I want to thank uh, Rebecca Sipis for being here today, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to her as we uh, begin this presentation. Well, thank you so much, David. Thank you, Karen, and everyone for being here. It's really a pleasure to be with the Early Music America community during um, this unusual and really difficult time 
Um, I know we're all sending our best wishes to friends and colleagues around the globe, um, and especially um, in this context to musicians who are suffering great financial loss right now. Um, so I hope that those of you who are able to will join me in donating to EMA's COVID-19 relief fund. Um, David is going to be helping me um, by sharing um, some PowerPoint slides at various times during this presentation. Um, if you'd like to, you can go to view options in Zoom, if that's where you are, and select side by side mode um, so that you could see the PowerPoint and me at the same time. Um, I find it kind of strange to talk to just to a computer or listen to a computer with no person there. So um, I'm going to try to go back and forth a little bit and hopefully um, you know, provide some variety, visual variety, um, but obviously whatever is best for you is great. Um, so we'll begin. Um, so David, if you don't mind maybe starting by just sharing the first couple of slides, I guess we don't, we can just skim right past the title slide. There it is, but let's go to slide two. Thank you so much. So in 1798, the German Jewish writer Wolf Davidson published his treatise called On the Civic Improvement of the Jews in which he argued for the inclusion of Jews in civic and cultural life of the quickly changing uh, and modernizing, modernizing kingdom of Prussia. Um, long seen as backward looking, parochial, and even immoral in their rejection of the teachings of Christianity, Jews across Europe had for centuries been subject to discrimination and persecu persecution, including restrictions on their professions and their dress, as well as limitations on their ability to live or live peacefully alongside their non-Jewish neighbors. In the mid 18th century, however, as notions of enlightenment swept across Europe, some rulers and some of their subjects began to take a more tolerant view of the Jews. While longstanding prejudices against Jews tested the limitations of enlightenment, Davidson's treatise on Jewish emancipation and what he called civic improvement of Jews, argued that Jews could indeed contribute fruitfully to the broader society. By way of justifying this agenda of emancipation, tolerance, and citizenship for Jewish residents of the Prussian kingdom, Davidson cited a long list of Jews, from philosophers and educators to practitioners of the mechanical arts who were already making contributions to Prussian society. And among these, Davidson mentioned a handful of musical amateurs, what he called dilettanten, um, amateurs for whom music was an essential part of the moral and cultural edifying process that he called Bildung. One such dilettante or amateur who Davidson noted had already acquired a reputation as a prodigious keyboardist here in Berlin was a certain Madame Sarah Levy. So we'll, uh, we'll go on to slide three. Um, these are two remarkable portraits of Levy. On your left is a silver point engraving done in the 1780s, shortly after her, three years after her marriage. So she's a young married woman here. And on the right um, is a lithograph um, taken toward the end of her very long life. Um, she lived to the age of 93. Um, and uh, let's see, I just lost my Word document. Hold on a second. <laughs> Um, so she lived this very long life and saw dramatic changes during that lifetime, right? If you think about the things that she witnessed during her lifetime, not only the movement of enlightenment, uh, the French Revolution, which happened, you know, down the, down the street from, the, from Berlin, um, then later the French invasion of Berlin in 1806, um, the Congress of Vienna, which her sister was, her sisters were involved in um, when after they had left Berlin, um, even the revolutions of 1848, she witnessed all of these dramatic changes in her lifetime. Um, so you could stop sharing now if you'd like. Um, so Sarah Levy was a virtuosic keyboardist in the late 18th and early 19th century. Um, she was a student of Wilhelm Friedemann Bach starting in about 74. Um, she was a patron of Friedman and his brother, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach. She was a collector of musical scores, a salon hostess, and a performer also in the public setting of the Zing Academy to Berlin. In her interest in the Bach family, she anticipated her great nephew, Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi, who would ignite the public Bach revival at the Zing Academy with his 1829 performance of the St. Matthew Passion. And it was probably 
in the library of the Zing Academy where Mendelssohn was studying um, under his teacher Carl Friedrich Felter, that he, Mendelssohn, first encountered um, scores uh, of Bach's music, among them scores owned by his great aunt, which she had donated to the Zing Academy um, starting around the 1810s. So Levy was also a Jewish woman who was part of the first generation of modernizing Jews. Yet in contrast to many of the women in her social circle, she retained a strong connection to Judaism and the Jewish community throughout her life. While many of her friends and neighbors converted from Judaism to Christianity, um, she retained a strong connection to Judaism, strong, almost stubborn, um, and she was involved in various ways with the movement known as the Haskalah or the Jewish Enlightenment. More about that soon. Levy's patronage of music was substantial as shown both by her commissions and her extensive collection. There are around 500 scores that survive that bear her unique stamp of ownership. Among these are works from the past, gen past generations, including local Berlin composers such as Johann Joachim Quantz, the Graun brothers, Janich, and others, as well as modern works, including some that she commissioned herself. Um, among these, apparently, are the Concerto for Harpsichord, Pianoforte, and Orchestra by Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, that was his last composition, as well as CPE Bach's Late Quartets. She amassed a large collection of music by J.S. Bach, selecting especially from his instrumental works, but largely bypassing the cantatas and other Lutheran sacred music. And she's now considered a very important figure in the reception and transmission of Sebastian Bach's music. Her collection preserves a number of works um, that would otherwise not have been, not have survived at all. Um, among these are the very interesting quartets by Johann Joachim Kranz. Study of Sarah Levy from a variety of perspectives elucidates, I think, her remarkable place in history. And in turn, it reveals aspects of her cultural, musical, and religious environments that might otherwise go undetected. In this presentation, I would like to consider some of these issues um, and ideas that can fruitfully be applied to study and understanding of Levy and her world. Um, I think that in the past, there's been a tendency for scholars to consider just one side of Levy. For example, musicologists have discussed her musical collection and her role in preserving the works of the Bach family uh, and other musicians. And this is only natural, right? Um, but for scholars in Jewish studies, she's a sort of footnote in discussions of other social and literary salons hosted by Jews in Enlightenment Berlin. Um, but the authors who have written about her from the Jewish studies side have not really had the musical expertise to consider how her musical salon related to or even was different from salons hosted by other Jewish women, such as Rachel Varnhagen, who was her uh, slightly younger than her. Um, in my work on Sarah Levy over the past few years, I've tried to cultivate a space for thinking about her from a variety of perspectives and actually as a sort of complete person. Um, with my colleague from the Rutgers History Department, Nancy Sinkoff, I've co-edited a book, co-edited a book um, called Sarah Levy's World, Gender, Judaism, and the Bach Tradition in Enlightenment Berlin. And with the ensemble that I direct, I had the opportunity to release a recording titled uh, In Sarah Levy's Salon. Um, the group is called the Raritan Players. Um, and in that recording, we explore some of the music and special performance practices um, that Levy cultivated. Um, so in this presentation, again, I'm gonna try to bring together some of these different threads, different um, kind of modes of thought and see how they might relate to one another, um, how, they, uh, how they inform one another. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to talk about the institution of the salon as a space that enabled women to exert cultural and musical agency, um, this at a time when women were by and large um, sort of prevented from, uh, from participating actively in the public sphere. Um, we'll also talk about the purposes and meanings of Levy's collection of scores. Um, the issue of anti-Judaism and its reverberations in Levy's world, and also, again, some of the performance practices um, that Levy cultivated in her salon. 
when the young Sarah Itzik was born, right, this is her maiden name, uh, Itzik, Berlin was a center of progressive musical activity. Um, the court of Frederick the Great was a meeting place for intellectuals, artists, musicians, um, and Frederick the Great displayed distinctively French tastes. The Prussian court and the city of Berlin were home to prominent musicians like Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, Quantz, uh, Johann Philipp Kirnberger, Johann Friedrich Agricola. Um, these musicians and many others had strong connections to the school of Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, Frederick the Great, of course, was himself a flutist and composer um, who studied with Quantz. Um, the Seven Years' War was financed in considerable part by Sarah Levy's father, Daniel Itzik. Um, this really drained Frederick the Great's coffers, um, and as a result, musical activity at the royal court began to suffer. Um, and this is part of a larger decline in what was called the Ancien Regime, the Old Regime, um, across Europe. We really see that power starts to kind of uh, come, come loose from the royal courts and be de-centered a little bit. Um, so music making started to happen in more, um, more active ways away from court, uh, especially in the homes of aristocrats and members of the emerging bourgeois class. One such home was that of Frederick's sister, the Princess Anna Amalia, and another was the home of the Itzik family. The Itzik's children, Sarah and her siblings, especially the daughters, received the finest musical education available. Around 1774, the young Sarah Itzik began studying with Wilhelm Friedemann Bach. Um, one manuscript that she once owned, which is now housed in a, the Newbury Library in Chicago, identifies her as Wilhelm Friedemann's Lieblingsschülerin, his beloved student. Um, and indeed, she is the only student, apparently, that he taught during this last decade of his life in Berlin. Um, her family, though, was always associated with the Bach tradition, um, so that Johann Friedrich Reichardt, a musician at the king's court, described what he called a Sebastian and Philip Emanuel Bach cult that flourished at the Itzig home. Um, so the performance situations in which Sarah Levy found herself don't always have clear analogs to performance situations today. Um, she performed in house concerts in her own home and also in the homes of other members of um, the kind of wealthy elite of Berlin. Um, starting around 1783, she herself began to host what we now call a salon. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what that means in a few moments. Um, she married Samuel Levy, who was a banker, but also an amateur flutist. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what kinds of music they might have played together. Um, she also, after the death of her husband and in the year that the, uh, the French army invaded Berlin, that was 1806, she began performing in public um, in the venue called the Zing Academy, which was a sort of bourgeois choral society. Um, but this was really considered a kind of public venue. Anybody could come and hear uh, the choral society sing, or in, in the case of, um, of Levy's instrumental performances, they could hear her playing. Um, and this is really remarkable, again, considering that um, it was generally considered uncouth, um, even, um, uh, I don't know, just inappropriate for women to put themselves on display in this public way. Um, between 1806 and the last documented performance is 1831, she is thought to have performed Bach concertos there regularly. Um, at some points, this was even happening apparently on a weekly basis. Um, and she played with what was called the Ripienschule, the Academy's instrumental group. Um, this is not easy music, um, and it demonstrates that she was quite a virtuoso um, as, a, as a keyboardist. <clears throat> so I'd like to say a few words about the musical salon as an institution of the European Enlightenment more broadly, um, since this actually is the focus of my current research and the book that I'm writing now. Um, the term salon in the 18th century uh, generally denoted a space rather than a social institution. So think of a living room, a drawing room, a parlor. Um, what we now call salons uh, as a kind of social practice did flourish in that period. They were just not referred to by that name. So they were called a tea tish or tea table. 
They could be an assemblée, an assembly, a conversazione in Italian or a conversation. Actually, the English use that word also, conversazione. They could be a party. They could be called a rout. Um, they generally involved a regular, usually weekly gathering um, of a very di diverse, right, heterogeneous group, um, including artists, intellectuals, socialites, um, philosophers, diplomats, politicians. Uh, they were usually presided over by a female hostess who would be the salonniere. Uh, most often, uh, she was a member of the aristocracy or an elite class. Um, generally restricted from participation in the public sphere, for example, through academies, women used the salon, which was situated in the home, but distinct from family life as a venue for exerting cultural agency. So it looked like it was domestic, right? By, by being situated in the home, it, it sort of took on the aura or the ethos of a domestic environment and therefore something appropriate for women or acceptable for women in society. Um, but it was really quite distinct from the activities of private family life. So by welcoming these heterogene heterogeneous groups of visitors into her home, the Salonniere and her daughters and her friends would learn about current ideas in politics and literature, philosophy, science, and the arts. Salons were multimedia and multi-sensory, so they would feature good food and drink, um, examination of artworks, furniture, fashionable clothing, and of course, the sounds of music. Salons constituted a venue for the exploration of intellect and reason and the mutual expression of sentiment and above all, perhaps, um, the cultivation of polite conversation, which was an essential part of being an enlightened person um, in the 18th century. So what I'm calling musical salons are those in which the Salonier had a particular taste or talent for music. So uh, there's no really clear line that draws uh, a distinction between a regular salon or a literary salon and a musical salon. But um, I'm trying to you know, sort of think about musical salons just defined very loosely as those in which the Salonier um, might uh, the Salonier might have a particular talent as a keyboardist or a singer and want to bring composers and amateur musicians and professional performers together. Um, so musical culture was in great flux at this point. And salons, I think, played a really interesting mediating role, um, bringing together professional musicians with audiences of patrons and listeners and performers. Um, they were a place where uh, people could experiment with new musical ideas and actually Salonier could contribute their own ideas, right? Not in a public venue through like publishing their, their ideas, their thoughts about music, but by talking to professional musicians, um, giving them feedback on their compositions and patronizing certain composers or certain types of music over others. Um, and this is a way that women were able to sort of leave their mark on musical culture, even though they were restricted from, public, from, from the public sphere in various ways. By the 1760s, musical salons existed across Europe and even uh, right here in the American colonies. Um, so public figures like Charles Burney, Benjamin Franklin, Hester Piazzi frequented and wrote about them and countless 18th century composers from Mozart to Boccherini to the Bach sons and hundreds and hundreds of other composers um, were shaped strongly by what happened in the salons that they attended. Now, as a Jewish woman, Sarah Levy fits into the story uh, of musical salons in, a, in fascinating and not always comfortable ways. Um, as I mentioned earlier, she was one of uh, a number of Jewish women, about maybe 18 in total, who hosted salons in Berlin in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And hers was one of the only ones that focused heavily on music. This in itself is remarkable. Um, in order to understand the full implications of what happened in her salon, um, and especially to get a new perspective on the meanings and purposes of her collection, um, I'd like to explore a little more fully how uh, music making among the Jews was perceived in the 18th century. The, the, the position of Jews in Prussia at this time was not secure, right? Jews did not have citizenship rights. 
Um, despite Frederick the Great's engagement with the Enlightenment, um, even Berlin was still colored by a pre-Enlightenment Lutheranism that was characterized by uh, latent or even overt anti-Judaism. And here I'll refer you to the work of Michael Morrison um, on this topic, which I think is extremely important and has been very uh, uh, formational for me. Um, you can check out, for example, his 2016 publication, his book called Bach and God. Um, and despite this, the Itzik family actually had a privileged status. Daniel Itzik, who was Sarah's father, held the title of Hof Jude, or court Jew, to Frederick the Great. Um, one of the leading thinkers of the age was Moses Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn achieved renown as a philosopher among both Christians and Jews. He wrote extensively about aesthetics and the arts, including music, um, along with topics including political theory, moral theory, and religion. Um, indeed, he thought that the arts had a role to play in the creation of a moral society, and he advocated for Jews um, as part of this wave of enlightenment and emancipation and participation in society to become educated in the arts among other practices. The relationship between Mendelssohn and the Salons is again complicated. Um, he encouraged you know, learning and intellectual development, but he also viewed the Salons skeptically um, because he thought that they uh, encompassed elements of frivolity, uh, too much socializing between men and women, um, excesses of um, sort of uh, material, material trends, um, things that were not really uh, sort of important to the life of a philosopher. Um, and also, I should note that the salons hosted by Jewish women were open to their Christian neighbors. Uh, they would often have Christian guests in those Jewish hosted salons, but it wasn't a two-way street. So the Christian women in the city who hosted salons uh, did not welcome their, the, their Jewish neighbors um, into, those, uh, into those situations. Sarah Levy has, a, a very, again, a very interesting uh, role to play here. Um, historian Natalie Neymark Goldberg has shown that Levy maintained her connection to, her Jewish, to the Jewish community throughout her life. Um, and she supported Jewish intellectual causes, schools, publications, again, resisting the calls by other women of her generation to just abandon Judaism completely, uh, assimilate, convert, um, just sort of walk away from the faith. Um, uh, music uh, was an essential component of Jews emerging identity as members of the Prussian society um, and the Prussian cultural heritage. Um, so I noted at the outset of this presentation, Wolf Davidson cited Levy's music making as evidence that Jews indeed could contribute fruitfully to Prussian society. So for Davidson and Mendelssohn and many other thinkers of the age, um, Music and the other arts had the effect of building up, right, the individuals who, who participated in, uh, in them, and this is the process known as building. So by, by making music together, people would learn reason, they would learn sentiment, they would learn uh, how to be moral. Uh, I want to caution, just as an aside, that this is a double-edged sword, right? As later history shows, uh, what was good art and what didn't qualify as such was often a matter of judgment. Um, so Jews were often thought of as unmusical. Um, and this is an idea that I want to explore with you now. Um, so David, if you could share slide four uh, with our guests. Um, there were, thank you so much. There were many, uh, many Christian scholars who engaged with, uh, with Hebrew uh, as and Hebrew poetry, biblical Hebrew as a matter of learning. This had, this had been true for centuries. Um, but in the 18th century, many uh, Christian scholars took a new interest in Hebrew poetry, um, searching for the sort of origins of true art, true poetry, and even true music. So for example, um, Johann Gottfried Herder, uh, one of the most famous scholars of language in the late 18th century, um, published this volume on the spirit of Hebrew poetry from, from Geist der Hebräischen Poesie, in which he talks about the sort of authenticity of ancient biblical poetry, its amazing um, you know, ability to move the spirit. 
and the fact, he said, that it was intimately connected with music. So he's thinking, for example, of the book of Psalms in the Bible, which has countless references to the accompaniment of musical instruments and to musical modes that were that are now that were in the 18th century lost to time. But he was sure that that the Psalms held the key to the creation of um, sort of pure, absolute, um, you know, authentic uh, music. Um, and if we go to, excuse me, if we go to slide five. Um, he was not alone in this. So this, this fellow here, Johann Nicholas Forkel, whom some of you might recognize as uh, one of the first uh, biographers of Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, and he was part of uh, the Bach family sort of circle of friends. Um, this is the title page of his General History of Music, a massive German language uh, collection, a set of volumes, in which he too describes ancient Hebrew music as um, the sort of true, truest form, most pure form of sung poetry. So he's connecting again the biblical art of poetry uh, with musical practice. But for Forkel, he contrasts the pure, wonderful music of the ancient Hebrews with the music made by contemporary Jews in the 18th century. Forkel's history of Hebrew music is highly polemical. He sought to discredit the music of modern Jews and in fact, delegitimize Judaism itself. So he says, this is in slide six, in the end, the music of the prophets of every nation progresses only hand in hand with the other arts and sciences. Uh, David, if you could please advance to slide six. Right, but because the Jews, this is in the middle of the, of the slide, general opinion sees the Jews as ignorant so even with the direct guidance of heaven, the culture of this people remained in every respect so far behind that it has hardly earned the right to be counted among the number of cultivated nations. He goes on to talk about the Jews, this is in slide seven. Um, he goes on to talk about the Jews as being without sciences, without customs, without fine feelings of the heart, without good instruments, without a singable language. And here I think he was probably referring to Yiddish as being an unsingable language and without an art of musical notation. And he even talks about later, he talks about uh, synagogue music, which he went and listened to as growling and as a frightful shouting. Um, so this is part of what Ruth HaKohen, musicologist from Hebrew University, has described as the music libel of the Jews, a kind of uh, dismissal and stereotype of Jews as totally unmusical, right? While Christians sing harmonious music that is well organized and in polyphony, um, Jews are capable of nothing more than noise. Um, for Jews, uh, Jewish thinkers of this age, actually, they rejected this narrative entirely, right? For Forkel, the idea was that if Jews had only accepted Christianity, they would have been able to continue a musical art. They would have been able to maintain a musical art in an orderly and harmonious guise. Uh, but because they rejected the teachings of Christianity, they rejected all of their learning and they lost the right, essentially, to be musical. In slide eight, we can see um, that Moses Mendelssohn actually kind of rejects, not surprisingly, he rejects this view. He says that the loss of the musical science among the Jews is on account of our great suffering and dislocation, right? That it's because Jews have been oppressed for so many years, that's why they lost the art and science of music. If we go on to slide nine, you can see the title page on the left of Moses Mendelssohn's translation of the Book of Psalms. So he takes the Hebrew Psalms and translates them into German. On the right, however, he and his, later it was really taken over by his student named Yoel Brill, translated, well, not translated, they transliterated the Psalm translations of Mendelssohn back into Hebrew letters. So on one side of the page of this book, um, you get the Hebrew text of the Psalms in the original, and on the other, in another column, side by side, you get Mendelssohn's German translation rendered in Hebrew lettering. 
It's a fascinating book. What's most interesting for our purposes, though, is that Brill, the editor of this volume, uh, appends an enormous essay here about the history of music making among the Jews. Um, and he most extensively among right in the in the ancient uh, the ancient temple which stood in Jerusalem, um, so he takes this as uh, as a signal of Jews musicianship in the past, and by writing this history in the present day, he's he's actually kind of saying yeah this is still part of who we are and what we do, and I think it's interesting to think about Sarah Levy's uh, collection in in this light. Um, so we could stop sharing the screen for the moment. Um, there are these opposing uh, views of Jews and music in the 18th century. Um, where does Sarah Levy fit into this, right? I think it's very easy to see her almost as an invisible figure, right? Someone who transmits music, who is responsible for taking music from Bach's generation and giving it to her, uh, her grand nephew, right? And others of his generation for the, the kind of ign ignition of the Bach revival. But where is she in the story? So I think it's interesting to think about the and the act of performing and what these things might mean. Um, I think that by assembling a collection of scores and by playing those scores in her home, in a way she is rendering them part of the story of music among the Jews, right? This is not Jewish music per se. This is not, it's not music with a Hebrew text. It's not music with any text, in fact. It's music that is modern, it's music that is progressive, that's forward thinking. In some cases, it's music that's old fashioned and backwards thinking, right? It's music from the previous generation. But all of it taken together forms a collection usable for this progressive environment of the salon. So thinking about what it would mean for a Jewish woman to play this music among uh, an audience, right, and with participants who are so heterogeneous, so diverse. They are Jews and Christians, they are artists, they're composers, they're professional musicians, they're philosophers, they're diplomats. To see a Jewish woman and hear a Jewish woman and her husband playing some of this music, and her sisters, playing some of this music for their guests gives it a new kind of meaning. Um, so that's the kind of central uh, theme that I wanted to convey. Maybe in closing, if it's okay, I'll just talk a little bit about um, some of the performance practices um, that Levy uh, used. Um, and the reason um, is that I, I think um, putting ourselves in a situation where we are confronting, um, you know, we, we sort of constrain ourselves according to past practices, um, raises certain questions and problems. I'll, I'll say what I mean more clearly. Um, so, um, Levy's collection um, suggests that like many Salonier of her day, she adapted the scores of the pieces that she wanted to play to suit the instruments and instrumentalists who were with her. So this might seem like an obvious point, but I think it's worth say, stating um, clearly that people have always played on what they had. Um, and especially in the environment of the salon, in which it was important to be sociable and inclusive, they did not spend time wringing their hands about whether the players were using precisely the right equipment for a given piece of music, right? So the absence of a particular instrument didn't stop them from playing a piece. They would simply adapt the piece to whatever instruments were available to them. And sometimes if they wanted to include more people, they could expand the instrumentation um, to suit the number of people that they had with them. Um, I'll give you an example from outside Sarah Levy's salon. In the salon of Madame Brion in Paris, um, we know that Benjamin Franklin, who was one of her frequent guests, gave her a glass harmonica. She didn't own any music for glass harmonica. No, there were no compositions that she played that were, that were expressly written for the glass harmonica. What did she play on it? Well, she played other pieces. She played pieces that might have been uh, originally for you know, another keyboard, or maybe she would play, Benjamin Franklin actually describes playing with Madame Brion um, sonatas on, she would play forte piano and he would play the glass harmonica. So there were, you know, they, they would sort of use the instruments that were accessible to them. Um, and there is a lot of evidence for this kind of adaptation and arrangement in Sarah Levy's salon. So David, if you would, if you would not mind uh, sharing uh, slide 11 here. 
Um, and we'll play a little audio clip uh, from the recording in Sarah Levy's salon in a moment. Oh, sorry, uh, if you could uh, go forward one more. Great. Um, so this is the uh, famous sonata uh, attributed to Bach, BWV 1031. Um, it's originally for flute and obligato harpsichord, meaning the harpsichord has both the right hand and the left hand written out. Um, Levy's collection preserves a unique version of this sonata in which uh, the flute part stays the same. The violin, the, a violin comes in and takes over the line that had first been assigned to the harpsichord's right hand. And now the harpsichord is freed up to play basso continuo. Um, generally, otherwise, the, the, piece, the piece sort of is identical to the version that most people know. Um, but I think that this kind of arrangement practice was not unique to Levy's salon at all. I think it's just something, what's unique about it is that she actually had it written out, uh, copied out for performance. Um, so uh, one fascinating thing about this piece if we play it, right, our, the goal in making this recording in Sarah Levy's salon was to kind of think through the problems that, that arise from her sources. So one really interesting thing was that as the keyboardist in this little ensemble playing with uh, a flutist and a violinist, now my right hand was freed up to play something else, right? So, um, so there's the sort of opportunity to improvise another uh, another line as a complement to these uh, these two lines that that are already notated. Um, so, David, maybe if you don't mind just playing like a minute or less of this of this little uh, this audio excerpt. <laughs> Finally, the other source that I just want to show you quickly um, is a, uh, this is a version of the organ trios by J.S. Bach. Um, all six of them are in this collection. This is an excerpt from BWV 526, the C minor organ trio. So in the original, or in the version for organ, I should say, um, we think that the organ pieces were actually adapted from earlier chamber pieces. But in the organ version, you have three lines. Right? One line played by the organist's right hand, one line played by the organist's left hand, and the bass line played by the organist's feet. Um, in this keyboard duo arrangement, you could see there are two part books, um, both keyboardists play the left hand, the, sorry, the bass line in unison with their left hands, and the two treble lines, the two soprano lines, are taken by one each of the, the player's right hands. Um, so what's, uh, what in the organ version is a uh, kind of solitary exercise in virtuosity, right? A single virtuoso organist would play the whole piece. Now becomes a little bit easier because it's only two lines instead of three uh, for each player. And it also becomes sociable. It becomes something that, that, that sisters um, or friends or husband and wife can do together. Um, and that's very much in the spirit of the salon. Um, so, David, if we could just hear a little excerpt of this, too. Thank you. Um, so you notice there uh, that you may have noticed that we we realized that on harpsichord and forte piano together, and the reason for that is we know that Levy owned both kinds of instruments, 
And the reason that we know she used them together is that she was the, uh, apparently the person who commissioned that concerto by C.P.E. Bach for harpsichord and forte piano with orchestra. Um, so just by way of conclusion, um, modern German and Jewish history has made it pain painfully plain um, that the, those ideals of tolerance and sympathetic enlightenment that Moses Mendelssohn advocated and that Sarah Levy apparently tried to advance did not necessarily take hold. Um, but the ideal remains, I think. Um, and in our, tr in our own times, I think it, its promise continues to resonate. Um, to me, it's important not just to think about this history, but to hear it, um, to enact it and experience it with all of our senses. Um, so even as uh, we continue to think about Sarah Levy and her world, I think it's also important to, um, to put those performance practices, uh, make them, to make them a reality um, and to hear the reverberations of uh, the sounds of her salon um, across the centuries. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to open the floor to questions and discussion. There was one question here about one of the slides, and I was trying to find which slide it referenced. Um, Sue Jones asked uh, about <coughs> something that was written at the bottom right hand side of one of the slides. Um, and perhaps I'll uh, it was handwritten, so perhaps I'll pull uh, I'll pull it up and see if I can find which slide was uh, which was handwritten. So let me uh, let me put that in. I'll share the screens again here. So something was handwritten at the bottom. Let me do this. Let me see if it a little bit better. Handwritten. Perhaps in French saying, but I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, is it on this, oh. on this Sonata page, perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> so it's to feel something. Ed Clorman, are you there? Are you able to read this? It's to feel something. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Uh, Store? Yeah, I said, I'm not sure. Yeah. We're going to work on this. <laughs> Sue, can we get back to you? I actually just looked at this, you know, this morning and said, oh, I hope nobody asks about that word. <laughs> <laughs> it's to feel something, but I, you could see that actually that they're contesting, they're questioning that authorship of, of Giovanni Sebastiano Bach. That's, that's what's at, what's at issue there. His name is crossed out there. Um, uh, any other questions? Any other questions right now? Thoughts, reactions? I don't see. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, it looks like someone. No, that was an old, an old one. Uh, we have. Ed oh, is curious yeah. about the German psalms written in the Hebrew alphabet. What's the reason? Uh, it's it's a fascinating volume. Um, so the the book is called the Sefer Zemi Rot Yisrael, the book of the the songs of Israel. Um, and the, actually the word zemer, zemirot, really implies um, music, right? Not just that it's uh, sheer or poetry, but that it's zemer, song. Um, so that's kind of a, specifically placing the, the book of Psalms um, within the context of a musical history. So this is an age when the um, the Hebrew presses, the Hebrew printing presses, really get going, um, and the the sort of the, there are these um, key Enlightenment printing presses that are issuing books in Hebrew. So this is one of you know dozens of books um, issued in these this early period, um, uh, and it it really it really picks up in the first decades of the nineteenth century. Um, so the the this, they're, what they're trying to do, Mendelssohn and his followers, is cultivate an educated approach to Hebrew literacy. So 
actually, if you look at the page, it's laid out almost like um, kind of classical biblical commentaries or Talmudic commentaries with the main text in the middle and then commentaries around. And it sort of, it, it looks at in, the interface is almost like a kind of traditional Hebrew text. Um, but instead, it's, it's this kind of progressive um, enlightened volume, which is meant to, um, you know, connect the ancient art of biblical song and poetry with contemporary aesthetic theories. Um, so it's, an, it's obviously for an insider crowd, for a, a Hebrew literate crowd, um, of, you know, of readers, um, but it's, it's meant to be, you know, sort of edifying and encouraging engagements um, with the movement of the Haskalah. There was, uh, there was another question here. There was a question asking whether or not there's any museum or perhaps her house or a house related with her family. Are, were those, are those still um, in Berlin? Where was the question? Yeah. Uh, yes, is there any museum or home still extant in Berlin? Not dedicated to her. So um, her home became the Berlin Stock Exchange. Uh, that's, how, that's how big and palatial the building was. Um, but it's, as far as I know, it is not um, sort of marked as part of her, her history. Um, uh, the Zing Academy still exists. And I, I think it's now a movie theater, right? I took a picture of myself, you know, a selfie when I was there in Berlin. Um, it's a very unassuming, unassuming building, but it, it actually has survived all the uh, you know, wars and everything else, um, it's still still standing. Berlin is one of those, is, is one of the, it's, it's a city that is, uh, I think it was, was it Goethe who said that it's constantly reinventing itself because right, buildings are constantly being either uh, torn down or destroyed by other means um, and replaced with, some, with something new. So a lot of that history, a lot of those buildings do not survive, but, but there are some. So related to that, uh, we had a, a, a question. Um, where is the where is uh, her collection located? And this person also said, "I'm not a music historian. I'm curious about how your interest in her developed." Oh, okay. Um, so her collection. Um, uh, okay, it's it's a kind of complicated history. Um, she donated the bulk of her collection to the Zing Academy, to the library there, uh, starting in the 1810s and probably on a, on a kind of rolling basis. Um, the collection um, was squirreled away by the Nazis during World War II. Um, it was a, a seen as a kind of a treasure trove as part of a larger collection of the Zing Academy, not just her collection, but the whole Zing Academy collection. Um, and then when the Iron Curtain fell, it was lost to parts unknown. Um, and it was really, it was only through the work of musicologist Christoph Wolf, um, who, uh, you know, who, who dedicated, uh, you know, years of his life to this quest to, to recover the Zing Academy collection, that it was rediscovered in Kiev, repatriated to Berlin, and it now resides in the, uh, in the State Library, the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin. Um, that said, there are also sources that she held back. She did not donate to the Zing Academy. Usually, most of them are solo keyboard works, uh, so not sociable pieces, but you know, not chamber music, not orchestral works, but pieces that she would just play herself. And those are now scattered. So there, that's why there's that one in Chicago that I mentioned. Um, oh, I can't hear you, David. Now that was yeah. I'm now I'm off mute. Uh, a question from someone who's following us, uh, who's watching on Facebook Live. Um, how do we reconcile the practice of adapting compositions to the musical forces currently available with the notion of period practice, trying to replicate exactly how the composer would have heard his or her piece? <laughs> yeah, that's a big. It's a big question, and you know, I'm not. I'm not trying to undermine the movement of you know of historical performance. I think I'm trying to expand it to think, you know, think more broadly. So there's definitely value, and I'm uh, not questioning that, in sort of, okay, I'm gonna play a harpsichord piece from 1690. So I better not, in 1690 France, so I'm not gonna use a harpsichord from, you know, 1680 Italy. And there, that's legitimate, right? That's there, the idea of using the particular equipment that's especially suited to the repertoire is extremely important. 
Um, however, I think that there's a kind of fallacy, right, that, okay, you know, by 1720, were maybe, were people still using harpsichords from 1680? Probably, right? They didn't just destroy the instruments they had. Uh, sometimes they did. Sometimes they updated them or threw them out and got new ones. But a lot of people kept older instruments, despite the fact that there were new technologies that were becoming available. So I think that there, th this project of the HP movement to kind of think about, um, you know, precisely the right equipment suited to every particular piece or every particular composer, I think that that is, um, it, it's sometimes misleading. It sometimes makes us think about practice, think that practices were more widespread than they were, or equipment had become more widespread than it really was. So thinking about reception history, how the music was actually used, that too can be part of the historical performance movement, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I, here's a question uh, from Paul, who is uh, with us on Zoom, who said, what does her music collection tell us about musical taste and values in this circle? How eclectic was it? How up to date? Mm. Um, so for one thing, I you know, it's hard to say, right, because she did not leave extent, we do not have extensive verbal documentation of what we were, what she was after, what she was trying to accomplish. So it requires us to do some, you know, interpretive detective work. Um, we know, for example, she was in, in terms of, okay, I'll start that sentence again. Um, there are about 77 I think that's not, that's an exact number actually, not about, but there are 77 pieces um, in the genre of the quartet in Levy's collection. But they are not string quartets in the sense of Haydn, you know, early Haydn string quartets. Instead, she's interested in the history of the Berlin Quartet. So contrapuntal works mostly for flute, violin, viola, cello, right, and, and uh, continuo instrument. Um, so the Quantz quartets uh, are an example of that. Those pieces that would not have survived if she hadn't preserved them in her collection. Those were, we, we knew that Quantz had written quartets because he writes about them in his treatise, but we didn't know where they were. And then Mary Oleskowitz actually sort of identified them and has written about them and issued an edition of them now. Um, so when C.P.E. Bach wrote his late quartets, apparently also um, uh, commissioned by Sarah Levy, uh, those very interesting pieces for flute, viola, piano right hand and piano left hand, right? They're quartets, but they're only for three instruments. Um, he's thinking about the Berlin tradition. He's thinking about that contrapuntal tradition that involves both a string instrument and a flute. Um, and he's not thinking about the very um, uh, kind of gallant approach that's taken um, in early Haydn string quartets. Um, so I think that there is a strong interest in local, the local musical tradition, right? Berlin, uh, North Germany, the Bach tradition, those kinds of uh, avenues. And she continues that in her patronage of the Bach sons. And um, I think there's also um, the, this interest in Empfindsamkeit, which was fas fashionable um, during, uh, during her lifetime. So I don't think she's entirely backwards looking, but there is this sense of linking uh, the earlier Prussian tradition, uh, traditions in Prussia, Saxony, with the practices of the Bach family and other kind of uh, Berlin composers of her, of her day. Uh, another question from someone on Facebook. Uh, what do you mean by spirits of the salon? What sets it apart from other forms of chamber music and their instruments uh, or of collaboration for the players? Um, so I do think that there were certain practices that flourished in salons. Um, that's not to say that they weren't also used in chamber music outside of salons. Um, but I think that the, the, what, I, what, what I was calling the spirit of the salon or maybe the ethos of the salon resonates well with certain practices and certain kinds of compositions. Um, so for example, the quartet, right? The, the quartet as a contrapuntal genre um, is one in which everybody participates. Everybody has something to say. Um, I also think it's significant that she collected so much music that includes both flute and keyboard uh, because her husband was a flutist. I also think that um, 
the, the keyboard duo, uh, and I'll go back to that idea, the keyboard duo, especially the harpsichord forte piano duo, was something that seems to have been used in many, many salons. Um, women were uh, maybe, first of all, associated with singing, but maybe just under that, they were uh, associated primarily with the keyboard as their kind of primary instrument, right? Very few elite women would be violinists or flutists, right? Especially the, the flute is a wind instrument and so was considered unladylike in the 18th century. Um, so to have uh, you know, the Salonier and her sister or the Salonier and her daughter playing together, um, that would require either that they play keyboard for hands, or if they were really um, erudite collectors who had multiple keyboard instruments, they would play keyboard duos together. Um, so that's why I think there are so many of these double concertos and keyboard duos in Levy's collection. She's using them together with her family members. And we again, we see this among other Salonier uh, in the 18th century. So again, that's not to say that those practices were exclusively used in salons, but that they enhanced that spirit of sociability, um, of conversation. Um, and so that's, that's what I meant uh, in talking about the ethos or the spirit of the salon. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the sake of time, maybe we'll take, do one more of the questions. There are several others, but um, maybe just one more. Um, and continuing with the, the idea of the salon. So how long does this custom of the salons continue? Someone mentioned, uh, was, it still, was it still prevalent by the time we get to Brahms and the Schumanns? Definitely, definitely. Um, so actually, in, in terms of musicological scholarship, um, the, the salon um, uh, has been most often explored in the 19th century. Um, so there's, there's actually a, quite a large literature about salons in that period. Um, the phenomenon that's often called the Schubertiad um, really was a form of, of salon. Um, so uh, certainly, um, you know, the, the salon persists throughout the 19th century. It's especially, again, associated with elite women, um, upper class, wealthy women um, who have, um, uh, you know, who have uh, means to attain a musical education and perhaps a, um, uh, you know, the, the time to continue practicing music. Um, but at the same time, they, they don't want to appear in public because that's still kind of considered um, uh, uncouth, um, unrefined. So the, actually, the, there's, a, there's quite a, a, a literature, quite an extensive literature on salons in the 19th century and even into the 20th century. Um, it's this earlier period that I think, um, you know, has been like a little bit explored around the edges, but I think that there's a lot, a lot more um, work that can be done on the salon in this age of enlightenment. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for your presentation today. It was very eye-opening. Uh, I wish we could, uh, we have uh, uh, many other questions. And so uh, I, uh, is, there, is there a way that if others would like to uh, engage more with this research or with you, how, how they best can go about doing that? Definitely. So my, um, my email, I think, was on that first slide, and you're welcome to put that back up again. Sure. Um, it's just my first name dot my last name at rutgers.edu. So rebecca.sipus at rutgers.edu. There it is. So it's mm -hmm. Cypus, not, not Cypress, so leave out the R. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm uh, very happy to hear, um, to hear from you and to try to answer questions as best I can. As we mentioned at the beginning, um, you can also, um, there, uh, the book, that, can you remind, remind me the title of the, the book that sure. you- It's called Sarah, Sarah Levy's World. Sarah Levy's World, that's a, a, a book uh, that you can read for more. And uh, the, uh, the recording that Rebecca mentioned several times is available so you can hear more of those um, uh, sort of uh, glimpses back in time to the salon. Um, and you can find reviews of both the book and the CD at earlymusicamerica.org. Um, we will be announcing uh, the next few interest sessions here in the next, uh, then just in the next couple of days on the EMA website, uh, and also be watching our uh, email newsletters to have those. We believe we'll have the next three set um, through uh, the second week of May. Um, in the next few days. And uh, we're looking forward to 
uh, engaging much more with uh, other aspects of early music and historical performance. Uh, so one more time, I want to thank you, uh, Rebecca Sipis, for presenting you. today and everyone else uh, who joined us. We will archive this on our YouTube channel, and it will also be available in the online interest section, uh, interest session part of the Early Music America website. So um, for Early Music America, I just want to thank everyone one more time. Thank you, everyone.